Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done. Yo bros, we're back with the Yo Elliott Show and today I got a guest who's a spiritual strength athlete. Somebody that I can totally relate to and I think a lot of you guys could too. We got Jared Zimmer, Dr. Jared Zimmerman in the house. Uh, a brilliant man, but as well a bodybuilder, strength athlete, uh, Man, so much we could talk about, but today, uh, after my quick introduction, we're going to do a dive into his book that he sent to me over 10 years ago before I was even Catholic uh, called The Ten Commandments of Lifting Weights, right? And so Jared uh, and I actually met 10 years ago when he invited me on his podcast, and uh, I went back and I, looked, and I looked that up, and I was like, wow, this is a real thing, and then... Uh, he sent me a copy of his book and it sat on my shelf because, well, I just a lot of people send me books and I wasn't interested in reading it at the time. But in 2019, when I returned to the faith, uh, it was funny. Uh, the following weekend, I was going to go camping with my family and I wanted something Catholic to read. I was like, OK, if I'm going to do this thing, maybe I should read some Catholic books. But I had nothing. I didn't even have a Catholic Bible. Uh, but I had your book, Jared. So thank you, man. You are definitely a bridge for me to be where I am today, brother. And thank you for joining me today. That's awesome, man. You know, it's it's so cool to see, you know, you never know what seeds are going to be planted in a person and you never know when those things are going to come to fruition. And um, yeah, I went back and listened to that old uh, podcast and stuff. It's just kind of surreal to to be back with you, man. Yeah. And we were obviously both in two very different places at the time. So it's cool that things come full circle. Uh, I also was shocked even after fi refinding your book and um, then rediscovering the faith. And I started watching Bishop Barron uh, on YouTube. And then I decided to sign up for Word on Fire. And there you were uh, introducing him on the on the podcast and, and in the the series itself, dude. And you're now uh, at a Benedictine University. You just got your your doctorate. So. Let's dive into the brains and then to the, then into the bodybuilding, man. So um, that sounds good, man. Yeah, uh, you just got your doctorate in what? So general humanities uh, with a concentration in philosophy. Um, I got it at Faulkner University's Great Books Honors College, and uh, wrote my dissertation actually on an American sort of uh, cultural philosopher named Russell Kirk. Uh, and I took the idea of the philosophy of personalism, which if any of your listeners are used to like John Paul II, John Henry Newman, Jacques Maritain, a couple of philosophers over the contemporary age, uh, they were really concerned about the human dignity and the loss of human dignity into these kind of collectivist movements like communism and the like. Uh, and Russell Kirk was an American uh, who, who was, had a very similar concerns. So I wrote it about uh, him as a, people typically consider him like the father of American conservatism. And so I tried to kind of label him also as a deeply Catholic personalist. Um, and so that was uh, uh, pretty fun to, to write. It took me about seven, eight months uh, to write the dissertation, then defended last summer. So uh, finally done. 
So wow, feels that's good. amazing. And you got your hands full. You got six kids, right? Six kids. Yep. Uh, what are their ages? So I have uh, four boys and two girls, and my oldest is 15, youngest is five. So, and so what makes you decide to go back to university when you got kids still in school, man? So what's funny is it actually started off um, from that book. I, I, I wrote those uh, reflections actually uh, because my mother kind of, I, I made a really kind of cool like framed image of the Ten Commandments, gave it to my dad. He's a big weightlifter. And my mom said, hey, you know, you really ought to try something with this. So I started going around to high schools and talking to young athletes about some of this stuff. And then I started to write it down. And then from there, I ended up getting an invitation to, to apply for a full ride scholarship for a master's in theology uh, from that because they were just interested in the topic and what I was doing online. Wow. Uh, so then once I got the scholarship for the master's, I was like, I mean, I'm an all in or all out kind of a person. So I decided, you know what, if I'm going to do this, man, I'm going all the way. And I took about three months off after I graduated with my th my master's and just went right into the Ph.D. And because uh, I figured if I left my foot off the off the gas a little bit, I probably would never go back. So instead, I was just like, nope, going full steam ahead. And my wife, who is a saint, uh, just totally supported me and had a whole lot of like 2 a.m. mornings doing a lot of reading and writing. Um, learning to be disciplined in that way uh, was pretty big. But uh, yeah, it was just kind of a dream that I had. And I was like, well, you know, I, I, like you, I'm trying my best to keep the idea of a, of a meathead not being a knuckle dragger, that there are <laughs> meatheads who think and have ideas and can read the great books. Uh, and so I said, I'm just going to challenge myself to do it. I, where I, while at the same time, still working out regularly, still competing, still doing what I got to do. Uh, so I lost a lot of sleep, gained a lot of gray hair, but uh, it was, it's been a fun uh, adventure. Wow, what amazing grace. So you wrote this book, you decided to do a college tour speaking at universities, and one of the universities liked you so much that they gave you a scholarship. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool, because man. Because it was an area that, um, you know, Theology of the Body is kind of a, it's still growing, and I know you've you've spoken with Christopher West. That's right. Um, but when I, when I got interested in it, there was almost nothing for athletes at the time. There was a lot of encouraging athletes to pray, encouraging athletes to take the, you know, the sacraments seriously, things like that. But I really wanted to dig into like, what is it about physical culture that can speak also to what JP2 was talking about in, in, in Theology of the Body and try to do it from a decently serious perspective uh, as a person who competes in these things, not just as an academic. Um, and so I think because of that, there was just a big interest in like, huh, this guy would be somebody we would love to represent our school. Yeah. You know, one of the most fascinating things I discovered about the faith is how it redeems the body in a world that grows so spiritual that it denigrates the body. And as a Catholic, we believe in, well, the divinity in a way of the body because of Christ. I mean, he, he incarnated. And so it kind of like gives a thumbs up, like, hey, the body's not a bad thing. We don't want to totally ignore the body. We want to fast ourselves to the bone and mortify ourselves such that this body is, is being punished. But you, are, as a strength athlete, uh, glorify the body in a way um, by demonstrating its abilities. You, I know you did the Highland Games, which is, we got to talk about that because that's really one of the coolest strength sports out there. It's so novel. But what other uh, strength sports were you involved in? So I ended up, uh, I competed in one bodybuilding competition. And um, while I liked, I didn't mind the training and the discipline and the diet and everything. The actual competing, I, I did not like. I did So I did one, hated it, and never <laughs> did it again. And uh, we'll probably never go back. I still appreciate it. I totally understand why people do it, but it just wasn't my thing. Uh, and then I got into a little bit of powerlifting, uh, but I also did martial arts. I never actually competed in martial arts, um, although I have been in a cage with a pro MMA fighter doing some sparring uh, before. And so that's about as high into that competition I've gotten. Uh, but I did Jiu Kendo, I did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I did kickboxing, regular boxing, um, just kind of really anything that has to do with You're a big guy too. How tall are you? 6'5". Six 6'5", five. Six five and how much do you weigh? So at my biggest, I was about 295. Right now I'm about 260-ish. So I but when I was doing the boxing uh, stuff, I was wrestling. about 245. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you're doing <laughs> exactly. gy yeah, boxing and jujitsu uh, at, that, at that size. Definitely a force to be reckoned with. Man, so you did martial arts. Uh, did you ever do strongman? 
Never did strongman. Nope. It's one I would love to do. Um, and there's some competitions around here where I live that I'd love to get into. Um, but just didn't, I never had the apparatuses necessary to, to train and some of that stuff. And I, there wasn't a local gym. The closest one was like two hours away. So I went one time, tried some of the apparatuses, but then the, the competition was like the next week. And I just I didn't feel confident. I didn't want to hurt myself. So <laughs> yeah, it's strange. Cause, uh, a lot of guys, strongman's their segue into Highland games, at least, you know, the men yeah. that I know, uh, a lot of guys get into straw man, lifting the stones, flipping the tires, dragging the trucks. And then they're like, hey, there's this ancient sport where we can toss cabers, which for anybody who doesn't yes. know, it's like a long pole and you got to fl flip it up and it end over ends. Uh, tell us about how you got into the Highland Games and some of your experiences with that awesome sport and what it's all about. So part of it was um, during COVID, I decided that I was just going to stop all cardio and get as big and strong <laughs> as I possibly could in my garage. Um, and I have a couple of apparatuses that I bought that are good enough to train for some Highland Games stuff uh, in there. So I ended up hitting a couple of PRs uh, in 2020. Uh, and then I saw that there was a local uh, competition coming up in 2021. And so I started training specifically for that, doing a lot more explosive movements, uh, things like that, and um, just signed up and went and just absolutely loved it. Uh, and so that was kind of the beginning of it. But then the other side of it is just falling in love with the ancient aspect of it, mm -hmm. of using these very crude tools, you know, throwing literal rocks, um, yeah. you know, throwing hay bales, that kind of stuff. It just feels like you're connected into something that goes way far beyond you. And it, and then there's also the warrior culture that goes into it as well, that these men were competing in this largely to prepare for war. Um, and so while they didn't have the same apparatuses that maybe the uh, rich English had, those Scots, they knew how to find ways to use the stuff around them to become better warriors. And so there's something you're tapping into that's just so primal. And I, I just, I love it. I think that it's also one of those cool sports that's global, uh, but it has never really gone to that level of like becoming pro where money becomes such a big issue there. There's guys at the top that can get paid pretty well uh, doing that, but it doesn't become this issue of like, these guys are just, you know, I love basketball. I'm a huge uh, basketball guy but once it gets to the point where it's like you're making 200 million dollars a year just putting a, a ball in a hole how much is that undercutting your love of the sport and how is it what does it do the dignity of the sport whereas like strongman it's just never gotten to that place it's it's got these huge competitions and the opportunity for guys to go pro but not at that level um and so even the ones i went to i met some pros just really down to earth guys there to help everybody really still very competitive um but they were just i, I was like these are my people i i like this yeah <laughs> And you're right. It shows like the the ancient trail of masculine initiation and and warrior culture, and you know, it's there was a documentary I watched not too long ago called Stones of Strength, I think, or Stone Land. Did you check that out? And it was did, like yeah. uh, a lot of it took place in Scotland, and it and it revolved around. I, I get things mixed up because I read a couple books about it, and I saw the documentary. But there's this rites of passage that was proper for young men in order to demonstrate that they were capable of working. I mean, that was a time when mm -hmm. boys wanted to work, right? And uh, if you couldn't pick up a particular man stone, they called it, that um, that you you just weren't fit to maybe work on the ships or to be a warrior. And those stones are still there today. I know a guy, I might get him on the podcast, Martin, I think his name is Martin Jacantis. He takes people on tours, historical st stone lifting tours, and you can go and you could pick up like this, I don't know, 800 year old store. I don't know. Who knows how long? Do you even know how long they've been doing the, uh, the Highland shows? Highland, I think, came in, I want to say 1400s, um, something like that. Um, but then you have like the Levantadores in, in northern Spain that it was another man's, man's uh, kind of uh, way of passage for them. Uh, but then also you go to Scandinavia and they've got these wet stones that you have to pick up um, that, you know, make it that much harder. <laughs> Those apparently go back to the 800s. <laughs> Um, so, and granted, wow. we might just not have historical accuracy of knowing how long back these actually go. They, it may be a whole thing. I mean, my kids naturally do it. You know, they just go outside and like, I bet I can throw this farther than you. I bet I can do right. that. So man has just been doing it probably since post Garden of Eden or something. Right. There's <laughs> something heavy. Can you pick it up? No. Can you pick <laughs> exactly. it up? And then, uh, exactly. men work in hierarchy. So we kind of like, you know, there's, there's, there's domination there. It's like, he picks up the stone. You don't. That exactly. guy's the leader. Exactly. That guy's and there's not. that great story of like um, Milo. Um, 
I forget what his last name was. He was a, oh, an Crete ancient Greek. or something like that? Of cr- uh, yes, Crote, yes. Crote, Crote Milo or Crete. something. And uh, how he picked up a calf over time until he could pick up a whole bull. And, I mean, we're talking about ancient Greece, uh, you know, at that point. And understanding how the body adapts and understanding how that makes him into a better warrior and a wrestler. And um, it's just, it's in our DNA, man, which to me it says it's something about God placing that in our heart, placing it in our bodies that we want these things naturally. And to me, that, that means it's a good, right? Yeah. Um, so why not partic- participate yeah. and make it great? And the body is beautiful. Uh, you know, why not, uh, why not train it or treat it in a way that allows it to meet its full potential? Um, progressive overload as a science. Uh, also, you know, it's like when men started recognizing that they could put effort into something and ch- literally change themselves, right? Because according to theology of the body, like the body is a reflection of the soul. Like you are your body. I like to say that the body is the mind and maybe even much more than that, um, that it then sort, sort of crosses over into something a bit more existential, right? Like I became attracted to lifting at a young age, but at the same time, it started to develop my character and I began thinking more spiritual thoughts. And so, you know, we kind of joked in the beginning about, you know, being a a, a, a book reading uh, behemoth or, you know, knuckle dragon genius, but really the two of them belong together and lifting, bodybuilding, strength sports, if you're, if you're really in tune, will eventually cross over into personal development and then the ultimate end would be spirituality and Christianity in its full, fullness. Absolutely. I mean, weightlifting changed my life in a way that other than coming to know Jesus in a very personal way, very little compares. Um, so I, I fell in love with weightlifting. I, I was a huge sports guy growing up. Uh, dislocated my knee playing football and the doctors were basically like look either we have to reconstruct that whole knee or you just start getting strong and so I started lifting weights and you know bought the encyclopedia of bodybuilding went that whole route you know Arnold told me to drink oil I'm probably gonna do it (laughs) you know those kinds of things back in the day but the main thing that I noticed in me is that I was a kid that had not necessarily like these like deep anger issues but I just had some some depression going on I had some anger going on as a lot of young boys do and I didn't know where to put it uh, especially because sports, in a way, was my kind of lowercase g god. So I was sitting there like, you know, what do I do now? This is all I wanted to do with my life. And so I was pretty ticked uh, about it. But then I got, as they say, bit by the iron bug. And it turned my mentality from this kind of like, oh, woe is me, these things happen to me, versus screw it, man, I can do whatever I want. You know, I, I can push through these walls. I can I can stand on my own two feet, learn how to become a man in this way. And, and, and my dad was a big part of it. He had a weight room back in the, I literally lived in the weight room for about four years of my high school because it was the biggest room in the house. And so I just popped a mattress in there and was like, I'm just gonna live in here now. So, um, uh, so every morning I was waking up, lifting weights, go to school, still played sports and stuff. But the main thing I noticed it was, was in here. Yes. It really helped me realize like, I'm not made of glass. And, and I'll stand up for myself. I will figure out what my goals are. I'll figure out a direction in life. If I find a girl that I'm attracted to, I'm not going to be shy and, you know, go off somewhere else. I'm going to approach her and be a man about it. Um, and it was weightlifting, I think, ultimately, aside from, the again, the love of Christ and the sacraments that really just as they say in the old way, put hair on my chest and was like, no, you, you can do these things. And you, it's, yeah. you don't have to be afraid. It's fine. It's still a form of initiation. I mean, my son's mm-hmm. 12 years old. And when he turned 12, I was like, well, that's it. You're going to lift now. And so every morning <laughs> he gets up with me and he works out. Today we ran a mile. So it was like an introduction into manhood. And I was lucky enough to be introduced to it at around the age of 13 by my uncle. And it's so funny. You and I have a lot in common in that way. Um, I used to get in trouble a lot. And as a result, my dad kicked me out of the, the house, per se. And I had to live in the basement. And so living in the basement meant living with the weights because that's where, the, where they were. And for a good, maybe not four years, I think for about three years, I lived down there with the weights and being never a really good student, um, never really liked reading or anything like that, of course. You know, I was an American kid. I wanted to play video games and play sure. sports. But I started reading bodybuilding magazines. 
And then I started buying the books. I remember uh, Mike Menser's heavy duty book. Like I always read it in the back of the magazines. I was like, I got to get this. And so all of a sudden I became studious about strength training. Dude, that's so funny, man, because Mike Menser brought me to a love of the Stoics. So, you know, he was a big like Ayn Rand guy, big into the ancient Stoics. And I was big into whatever he was into because I'm like, man, this guy's like a really smart bodybuilder. He has something that Arnold necessarily didn't have at the time. Uh, maybe Arnold was a smart thinker, but the encyclopedia bodybuilding did not have philosophy in it. Right. right. <laughs> Whereas Mike Mincer spoke about these things in the sense of man as hero, man as archetype. You know, he used these kind of Jungian theories, he used the Ayn Randian theories. Granted, I would disagree with some of the things he was talking about, but it made me go, well, what is he talking about? And then all of a sudden I'm picking up Marcus Aurelius. I'm picking up, you know, Cicero, Seneca. And I'm like, this is incredible. And in high school, you'd have to like tape my eyes open to read a book because I just hated it. And now all of a sudden I'm, I'm just like eating this stuff, you know, day in, day out, almost more important than like going to the club back then. You know, it's right. like, wow, I'd much rather be at home lifting weights and then reading this about Stoics. Um, so it, just, it changed my life uh, a lot. And it's, it's and same as you, it started off by getting my body in a certain place. And then I realized like, now I need to follow it up with the mind. You know, I can't have a, I can't have a weak mind and a strong body. It just doesn't work. So right. something's got to give. Uh, and so it was Mike Minster really that introduced me to some of the classic Stoics. And then the Stoics brought me back to Jesus ultimately. So Amazing. <laughs> and so you brought it all together in uh, uh, an academic but practical work in the Ten Commandments of lifting weights. Uh, well, well, you talked about your inspiration of writing it. Why don't we dive into each of those Ten Commandments and um, and explore that way? What do you say? Let's do it. Cool, man. So I got them here. I'll call them out, and then maybe you can expand on each. So the first of the commandments for lifting weights, which is a cross between, of course, you know, the Decalogue of the Old Testament and principles for growing stronger physically in life, is... Thou shall not forget who gives thee strength. Tell us about that one. Yeah, you know, ultimately, all of creation is contingent on God's gift, right? That we only exist because God decided that we ought to exist. And because of that, we owe a certain sense of gratitude towards the God who created us for the things that we can do. You know, Tolkien used to talk about this idea of co-creation with God, and he was talking about it in the idea of creating myths, the, agree, the idea of creating good literary story that inspires us to these higher things. And the way I see it is that in the sense of weightlifting, in the sense of taking care of yourself, physical culture, you're co-creating, you're co-participating in something that God, without, without needing you, brought you about out of sheer act of love. So why not respond to that in gratitude, meaning being the best you can be? striving to be as strong as you can be as if that's what you want to accomplish trying to striving to run farther run faster because you're participating in something that god has given you but then along with that it's to be gracious even in times of struggle so when i when i jacked up my knee i could have you know cursed the world and, and went a certain way instead it was no this is a reminder that i need to be humble this is a reminder that i'm not superman that i'm not some kind of ubermensch that I am a created a person. Uh, and you see that in like aging athletes too, that they start not having as many PRs, right? They, don't, they start having some struggles with some things. They're not able to lift what they used to be able to lift. And that's a sign that this is a moment in your life where you realize I am a created being. And because of that, I need to operate in that which God gives me. Um, and so oftentimes we forget that because, I mean, and, and it's, a, it's a strange kind of dichotomy because on a human level, I want young men, especially or young athletes, to think about the idea of strength of something that, yeah, you personally have to work on. You have to be disciplined. You have to get the right mentality. You have to eat right. You have to sleep right. And because of that, your muscles will grow. But on the other end of it, ultimately, ontologically speaking, you are only alive and well because God wants you to be. So you have to be grateful for that. And you have to think of strength in that sense. We often think of outside blessings like a new car or a nice mm -hmm. job or a nice income as these like God's blessing with these things. I'm saying strength athletes, guys, all you athletes, you should appreciate these things well beyond just something that you personally have worked for because it's a constant gift that can at any given time be taken away. So why not be, why not be grateful in the here and now? It puts so much into context, right? Because 
a lot of us go into strength sports or bodybuilding because we got a chip on our shoulders, you know, kind of like you said. And then this sense of pride begins to take over. At least I know for me, um, this, I, you know, lift myself up by my bootstrap sort of attitude where it's like, well, look what I did. I can do, and you even said it before too, it's slippery. It's like, well, I can do it. <laughs> I can do anything. And so that kind of attitude for me, I know uh, it, it helped, but at the same time, it perverted my mentality where I thought I really believed that I did it and I could do anything. And there was no sense of gratitude, even for the DNA coursing through my blood from my parents. It was like, no, my hard work. I got up. I did this. When this commandment really uh, grounds us and reminds us, that no, and I knew this from, ex I learned this from experience, you know, it's great that you have this as a principle and that people could learn it ahead of time, but it was the injuries for me that reminded yep. me, dude, you did, this is not yours. You didn't do this. You didn't make this happen. And as quickly as you got it, it's as quickly as it can be taken away. So good commandment. Yeah. Number one. Yeah. yeah. Commandment number two. Thou shalt always give the glory of muscularity to God. A little bit of an extension of the first yeah, so one. Whenever I, yeah, so, you know, like as I said, when I first started getting involved in uh, weightlifting, in large part it was a focus on bodybuilding and more aesthetic uh, than anything else. And um, as you know, I mean, aesthetics oftentimes lean over towards power and strength and things like that too. But um, the idea that I kept coming back to was, well, then what do we do about vanity? You know, because naturally we want to look good. Naturally, especially athletes want their body to look a certain way. Um, you know, depending on what, ath what, what kind of strength they're doing, most of them would still love to have abs, would still love to have, you know, <laughs> vascularity, these kinds of things. Um, and is there something wrong with that? Is there something unnatural about us wanting to look good? Um, and basically what I think is that if you are glorifying God and in so doing, you are being modest about the way you do it. Um, so you're not just flashing it around so that, you know, everybody's staring at you. But instead it's, I'm doing this because as a created being, I want to emulate my creator in his perfections. And one of his perfections is beauty. So why would I not try to make myself more beautiful um, so long as I can keep my ego in check, so long as I can still stay humble? Uh, but also, I mean, I'm just thinking about young athletes in particular, guys who aren't married yet. You should want to look good for your future partner. And then for married guys, you should want to look good for your current partner, right? Like, I think that's something that if you let yourself go and it just shows maybe a lack of caring or there's all kinds of things that go into that um, ultimately. Um, but I try to figure out what do you do with vanity? I mean, scripture says vanity of vanities, all is vanity, right? And so when it comes to the idea of muscularity in particular, which I, I think is a beautiful thing, John Paul II says that the human being is the masterpiece of creation. And in so doing, by his body, he's talking about that, right? And so what is it that's so eye-appealing, that's so deeply ingrained in us that we know the body is at a higher level than any kind of art we could operate, any kind of music? There's something else there. Now, how do we make sure that we're not doing it in vanity, but rather doing it in a way that glorifies God? Um, and so I tried to kind of think through what are some of those. And a big one, a big one, which we've already kind of talked about, is mental side of things. How am I thinking about this? What kind of mentality am I putting towards this? Right. Do I bring this to prayer? You know, um, I mean, how many, how many times have people brought actually, hey, I'm trying to lose 20 pounds and I'd like to pray that my way through this so that it's not vain? <laughs> right? <laughs> it's rare. I don't, I don't think I've ever it's done that. a different that. way of seeing things, you know, and it's a way to intertwine a love of wanting to look a certain way with the idea of glorifying God, ultimately, um, that we all point towards something else um, rather than just point towards me. It's interesting that you bring up art. Um, I know you told me that you watched the interview I did with uh, Arthur Kwan Lee, and we talked yeah, about how, you know, art reflects the culture. And it's interesting to watch, well, not just the art itself, how it reflected, you know, maybe uh, ancient Greek art compared to the art that we have today, but even the depictions of the body, you know, like a, a, a depiction, a sculpture of like the David or something like that, or like these, these muscular uh, sculptings of men, uh, you know, naked men, but like beautiful bodies that the ancients uh, look, looked up to and, and, and honored. 
and then, and then today where we got like you know fat is beautiful and like you know in New York City they have g giant pictures of obese women wearing panties and somehow we're supposed to think that that's uh, beautiful but in fact it's it's not just ugly art but it's a degradation of the body it's not spiritual it's not good at all yes well you know and I, I love that you mentioned the idea that you know the mind the body and the soul are are incredibly inter are intertwined with one another because a healthy body is a beautiful body right ultimately and so in a way it's it's promoting or it's projecting something that's even deeper than just the physical side of it um, granted, I think in modern bodybuilding, you could make an argument that there's sometimes some unhealthy things going on underneath, uh, you know, some practices going on that you've got this incredible body, but things are kind of falling apart inside. Yeah. Um, but all that being said, there's still something that the ancients knew. This is reflecting something much deeper. And it's that, I, I don't know the actual Greek term, but asics, which is basically like the, the body reflects the soul, the soul reflects the body. Uh, and so they knew that a healthy, strong body represents something else. And a lot of the ones previously, they were all warriors. So that healthy body also meant something along the lines of protection, providing, being able to stop the enemy from coming into our territory. And in order to do that, you can't look like these models you're talking about, right? Like you, you have to be strong, you have to be able, you have to have a healthy body. So it, it communicates so much more than just the human body. Commandment number three, thou shalt use this time for self-realization and mortification. Oh, I love that, especially since I just learned what the word mortification meant a couple of years ago. Tell us about that. I'm going to read it one more time. Thou shalt use this time for self-realization and mortification. What does that mean? So the idea of, of self-realization, and I want to be kind of upfront about it, and I think I am in the chapter as well, that I, I'm not talking about the sort of Buddhist practice or this, this Eastern practice of finding oneself in the void. Rather, I'm going with what Socrates was talking about, and you see this in a lot of saints, of who am I? Truly, who am I, right? What do I stand for? What are my principles? What are the things I'm not willing to bend on? What are the things that I want to live out? What are my goals? Ultimately, in Christ, that's what we are. We, we find ourselves fulfilled in Christ. But as we've talked about before, there's those moments of just on a human level of figuring out what am I all about? You know, these anger issues are coming from some. And it's likely because I'm not living according to what I know my principles are. So I'm upset. Um, and so finding that out, I'm also, I'm a huge uh, Bruce Lee fan. Um, even though he wasn't Christian, I still think he was an incredible philosopher. Um, I actually have a son named Bruce uh, that I named after him. So <laughs> just an incredible uh, guy. And a big thing for him was even in combat, I'm learning more about myself than I am about the enemy. Right. So even in that, I'm learning more about who I am, how I react to things and the way he explained it. And you actually can see a correlation between him and John Paul II, that I come to find myself ever more through the interaction with other people because I have to react in a certain way. I have to you know, respond in certain ways. And what the way I kind of explain it in that chapter is that in the weight room, you've got this like thing in front of you that you've got to respond to. Are you going to, you know, put five more pounds on the bench press and wimp out? Or are you going to say, nah, this thing's moving. I'm, I'm going to move this yeah. thing regardless. And then that spills into, as I said, with other things like even dating life and, and spiritual life. And you learn, I'm not made of glass. You learn, like, I know who, what I'm about. And, and sadly, I think in the, the modern world, that's a question that just doesn't get asked nearly enough. Uh, because I think that what happens is, it's, it's about your feelings. It's about who you think you are. It's mm. about you know, how emotions are telling you to feel versus truly reflecting on philosophical principles, on political principles, on family principles. That's not emotion. That, that's a much bigger picture than we're, than we're talking about. Uh, and then mortification is the idea of sort of discipline. The way I used to explain it is that you're disciplining the body in order to the order the soul to the right uh, end. Um, and so we do that through fasting as Catholics, as Christians, um, you know, there's ancient practices where they used to actually whip themselves, uh, because it was telling the body, you're not the boss ultimately, right? The soul is ultimately the boss. Uh, and you order the soul towards the right telos, the right end, which as we know is Christ himself. Um, and so through the weight room, while we aren't necessarily tearing the body down, although as you know, 
you tear down muscle in order to make it grow. But I'm saying like, rather than making myself into something weak and unable to stand up for myself, I'm making myself something stronger for the mission that's been given to me. Um, so as a father, as a husband, as a Catholic, what is that mission? And is a healthy body going to help or hurt that mission? I would ultimately argue that, it, of course, it's only going to help. Um, so you mortify the flesh in order to order it towards the right telos. And in so doing, through the weight room, you become stronger in finding that telos and, and, and fulfilling your mission towards it. I like that you talk about realization, um, you know, as opposed to fabrication. You know, a lot of times we think more of ourselves than we really are. And in a world that tells you that, you know, you're special and once again, you can do anything and that, you know, as long as you put your mind to it, when the fact is that that's usually not true. <laughs> and one place you'll always discover that is in the weight room. Like it's, I liked your example because it reflects one, you know, an earlier version of myself, which is I'm going to put five more pounds on that bar. And if I crush my body, it's going up. It does not matter. Right. And so it's like, I'm, I'm not going to realize myself in that I'm making myself, but I'm going to realize myself by like, what can I actually do? And it goes like, you know, it goes to that extreme as well as obviously it goes to that extreme where it's like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to realize this by making it real by overcoming this resistance. Uh, and either you do or you don't. And that's what's real. And at the same yes. time, you know, being a 44 year old uh, beat up athlete, you know, I've had tore both biceps tore my Achilles tendon. The realization of the weight room now is you shouldn't put five more pounds on that bar. The, the reality is that that's a dumb idea and it's not going to serve you at all. So it's not it's not so much like uh it's an aiming, it's an observe as an observation, like who, who, like you said, who am I? Where am I right now? And let the iron dictate that. Because I if I put five more pounds in the bar, the iron's gonna tell me tomorrow, now nah, that's why your hip hurts. And so <laughs> the fact is you, sh you probably shouldn't have done that. You should have maybe stretched a little bit more. And I love the mortification yes. part. I think that's um Man, uh, we're talking strength sports and lifting weights. And of course, that's where I made my scene, uh, you know, made my splash on the scene. But today, it has a lot to do in the, in the work that I do and the men that I mentor, a lot to do with denying the flesh, right? Like there's so many tempting vices from, you know, pocket pornography on your phone to, you know, guys are smoking vapes wherever they go. And it's like they just can't break away from this dopamine uh, dripping pleasure seeking. And so mortification in the same light is, you know, how can I deny, like, deny myself, punish myself, but also deny myself, right? Yes. And in, in a time of such high levels of consumerism where it's actually cheaper to go to McDonald's and get a, you know, double cheeseburger than it is to go get some chicken breast and vegetables, the little small things like that mean a lot in the long run. And so you learn those things that can take you away from the idea that being comfortable all the time is just not a good way to live. It's just not. And so um, I try to bring up the kind of the martyrs, the the ancient warriors, when I, especially the high school guys, they always kind of glob onto those things and college guys too, of – Look, these people are people who who you think like so Saint Jean de Berbouf, who's a North American martyr. I mean, this is somebody who had his fingers bit off by the American Indians, sent went back to France and begged, send me back. I want to go back, but I need somebody to hold up the Eucharist for me. Like <laughs> you you want to talk about cojones? Yeah. I mean, that's that's it, right? And that's the level that all men are ultimately called to, maybe not to red martyrdom or, or whatever, but we all are called to some level of strength in that in that regard. You ain't gonna get that with the pocket porn and the easy fast food and the, you know, all these other things that just make you feel comfortable all the time. That's not to say we can't take it part in comforts at times. There are times, there are places, just as scripture says, but ultimately, like, you need to be prepared for a very difficult life, and that's a good thing. It's not a good thing to be comfortable all the time. Uh, so to hold those images in our minds of like, I want to be the samurai in the garden, man, who's ready to go fight whenever it takes. But it takes a lot of discipline, takes a lot of mental, physical, spiritual discipline to get to that place. But when it's time to go, he's ready to go. And that, that is what I encourage guys to think about of like, look, when life hits you smack in the face, because it's going to at some point, what kind of life are you living now that you're going to be able to stand up for yourself, do what you got to do, 
and keep the faith. Uh, it's, it's not going to be through comfort. I thought of something while you were speaking. You you mentioned that this time, that's how you describe it, this time is for self-realization and mortification. I think that that's significant as well because uh, discipline is about structure and structure is about carving out time. Like uh, I've discovered, and I'm pretty sure there's scientific facts behind the fact that I just said it was a fact, fact behind the fact <laughs> that the more you carve out time in a structured way every day, same time doing what you got to do, the more flow and the more, um, you know, the, the, the greater your discipline and commitment and, and, uh, and virtue by carving out that time. So I think that was brilliantly put. Let's go to number four. Yeah, I think especially males are very repetition oriented. They, they need their schedules. And when those things get, get thrown off, it's, it's tough. Um, so I, I typically lift weights in the morning and when I don't get it in the morning, it just because of some kind of issue or a family issue or a work issue, it, it's like trying to go back now after work, it, it's almost impossible. I, I just can't do it. So I have to have my time. And if I don't have that time, my whole day is thrown off. Yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of a funny thing. Yeah. It has to be seven days a week. It has to be, at least for me, you know, there was a time where I was thinking, okay, weekends, maybe I can you know, sleep a half an hour later. You got to be like a machine <laughs> every yep. single day. Perfect. So number four, thou or commandment number four, I don't want to cheapen these. These are commandments, fellas. You're commanded to do these. Thou shalt use this time. Okay, once again with the time. This Thou shalt use this time to train to be a warrior for the Queen Mother Mary, warrior of warriors. Okay, tell us about that. Yeah, so there's a couple of things there. Um, just to start off, I guess, with this time again is, especially as Catholics, you know, people will tend to point us and say, oh, you worship Mary. No, we pray and ask for Mary's intercession, knowing that as the Son of God's mother, she has a very connection with Jesus and a very, uh, very serious connection with the Holy Spirit as well as God himself, so in the Trinity. So when we ask for her intercession, it's a very special level of intercession that we're asking for. Uh, but that's not worship, so it's not the same thing. Right. Uh, so for the non-Catholics that might be watching. Uh, but the time in the gym, thinking about a Marian devotion of, even in here, I want Mary to be my prime intercessor here. Um, it, to me, just uh, communicated a big, one, importance of Mary's role in salvation and in our relationship with Christ. But two, you know, if you look at the ancient understanding of the Queen Mother, so we we call... Mary, the Queen Mother, traditionally, because Christ is King of the universe, right? So Mary being the Queen Mother, if you look traditionally in the medieval ages all the way back to the, the ancient biblical ages, the Queen Mother had a very specific role. One was that she represented everything that was good in this country, worth fighting for and worth dying for. So people would, soldiers would look to the Queen Mother as, this is what I'm actually going to war for, her virtuousness, her purity, her beauty, what she brought into this world, our King, that's what I'm going to war for. But then the other side of it is that um, we call Mary a warrior because even in the book of Revelation, we see her uh, as, as depicted standing on the serpent's head. So the primary you know, fighter against Satan himself in this world is Our Lady. Um, and it's, a, it's such a beautiful way of showing how she fought through humility, through do whatever he tells you, through, you know... <laughs> helping even Christ do his first miracle. She was there for him. And in that way, she's there for all of us. Um, so I tend to see her more as like a Galadriel figure from like Lord of the Rings of somebody who helps bring the gifts into this world that's going to help us fight. And to me, to leave that relationship, that intercession, that prayerful love outside of the weight room is folly because this again is where we're realizing who we are. This again is where we're, grat we're grateful for what God's given us. And we're participating in something that God has given us to, to, to co-create in a way. Why not ask his mother to be there with us? Why not ask his mother to, you know, teach me to be a warrior in here? Teach me what I'm supposed to be fighting. Because oftentimes, too, I think weightlifting one of the, is one of the greatest times to think about life and how you ought to respond to certain things, certain struggles, you know, certain relationship needs, you know, those kinds of things. It's a great place to think through those things through. 
So what I'm saying is invite Our Lady into those moments too. You know, have her intercede on Christ's behalf for us in those moments. She knows exactly how to fight. She knows exactly how to win the war. Well, if you're going to call yourself a warrior, if you're going to call yourself especially a warrior for Christ, you've got to have her, uh, his mother next to you. There's so much to unpack there. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Um, where do I begin? You know, as the mother of Christ, she brings God to earth. And in a lot of ways, when we're in the weight room, I, I'm seeing this correlation where like we're almost being rebirthed. And so by bringing Mary into our practice of strength training and weightlifting, uh, maybe maybe there's a sense of being rebirthed. Maybe her grace, being a mother, right, which all mothers are the bearers of matter, right? We all come, we're all clothed with the flesh of our, of our mother, um, that the graces that she brings to us in the weight room will help a sort of a rebirth happen, both, you know, physically in matter. She's our spiritual mother. Uh, and then also in life. But then I'm also thinking about this warrior part, right? Uh, from what I understand, you know, I'm, I'm newly formed in the faith that uh, there's nobody that Satan hates more <laughs> than Mary. And, you know, you might say, well, you know, what about Jesus and stuff like that? But he hates Mary in a special way because she's a creation, right? Like Christ is God. And so Mary being a creation that's higher than him as an angel just makes him so mad. And, you know, they often talk about the Antichrist, but I can't help but to think that there's a, there's a deep anti-Mary in the world. Uh, you know, being a Catholic, one of the things that we're confronted with is all the misconceptions about Mary and, and her place in our heart and in the faith. And to be a warrior is to stand up for the truth about who she is, uh, regardless of the hate that Satan has placed in the hearts of many well-meaning people and Christians. But we got to fight with the sword of truth. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one of my favorite um, sort of reflections about Mary, um, one is from Fulton Sheen. Uh, so if anybody doesn't know who that, he was an archbishop of the United States. A uh, very, very popular TV show back in the 50s. You can still see it on, on YouTube. It's called Life is Worth Living. I, I have a son named Fulton. He had a big impact on me. Um, but he actually compares in his book, um, Mary, the World's First Love, Mary as a perfume bottle that if you dump out all the perfume, even years later, you can still smell the essence of what was in that bottle. And in, and in Mary, what we have is the womb that birthed Christ himself into this world. Literally, the incarnation of God himself into this world was through her womb. Now, we can ask spiritually, rebirth me in your womb. Now, what happens is the essence of Christ is now on, grafted onto you. And you're brought into this world through Our Lady's spiritual womb, if you will, as her spiritual children. And I, I have always loved that image of like what we're actually asking for is give me that essence. Give me whatever it was that you provided Christ in his incarnation. I want it. I want it, I want it grafted onto me. And it was through your womb that it happened. Um, the other side is that I love Mary as the undoer of the Eve's knot. So Eve in the Garden of Eden and Adam, of course, who was also to blame, but the knot that occurred with them and how Mary comes as the undoer of that knot. She brings in the incarnation. She brings in what was properly understood, what God wanted for us. Um, and so seeing in her even the ability to, you know, mankind messed up and, and through her, through ultimately her son's salvation that she's participating in, we too can undo those knots in us. Uh, and I think ultimately, right, that's what we, we, we really want is peace. We want, you know, that, that feeling or that, that uh, love, that ultimate telos of knowing what I belong to. Uh, Mary is our, our perfect guide for that. And that's also another reason why Satan hates her so much, because through Eve, sin was brought into the world. And through Mary, sin was resolved through Christ. Right. So he just can't stand her. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So powerful. Uh, I think about when I was in high school, I would have motivational posters on my wall in the in the basement when I would lift, and I had a lot of girls up. You know, I put pictures of pictures of pretty girls, and I'm lifting because I want to impress those girls. I'm thinking now that it might be proper to uh, replace those pictures, not that I have them anymore, but replace those pictures with a picture of Mary, right? To venerate yeah. her in that way, because uh, not only is she undoing knots um, as the opposite of those were those you know women were 
putting knots. <laughs> they were creating knots. I'm looking at those pictures and I'm like, lusting and wanting and needing and creating creating knots in me, right? Where if we have the undoer yes, of knots, yes. maybe she brings some more virtue, spiritual virtue in the weight room as a result. One of my favorite images of her is actually Our Lady of Chestahova. Um, and uh, so there was a, a church that, that burnt uh, and this icon was in there. And so they kept the icon and reproduced it because it survived the fire. But it's got scratches on it. It's got this like kind of ski or this kind of stern look on it, and she's holding Christ. But it looks like, man, that woman looks like she's leading a team of leading a, an army ready to go. Um, and so, I, if you want one, that would be a good one to do. I think. Okay, <laughs> Testahova. Testahova pole. Oh, I gotta yeah. go check that out. Yeah, I like, like a lot of the Eastern icons, man. So I beautiful. Assume. Like, there's something otherworldly about those. Beautiful. Yes, it's it's similar, I think, to what I love about Arthur Kwan Lee's yeah. work. There's like a, a sternness to it, but also a beauty. There's just something that you see in the Eastern icons, because uh, sometimes in the in the West you have this kind of overdoing of like rosy cheeks yeah. and you know very bright, and it's like, yeah, that's okay. I want that like strength, and and then that's what you see in those icons. That's why I love about Eastern spirituality in regard to like the Catholic spirituality things. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I love those. I'm gonna definitely check that out. That's gonna be in my gym. Okay, so we get, we're up to number five, Ten Commandments of Lifting Weights. Thou shalt use this time to appreciate what mus masculinity is, truly a gift from the Almighty. I'll read it one more time. Thou shalt use this time to appreciate what masculinity is, truly a gift from the Almighty. Tell us about that one. Yeah, and this one, um, you know, it's funny, I originally wrote the Ten Commandments of Lifting Weights for males in particular because I was going around speaking to young males uh, as athletes. But the more I think about this one in particular, I think it, it's something that, that females could also better appreciate as well. Um, so one of the big concerns I had as I got into speaking, as I got into working with young athletes, was the ways that masculinity is portrayed. Um, and of course, you know, I wrote this 10 years ago, it's only gotten a lot worse uh, in the culture. Um, and so like, I think one of the examples I use in that chapter is like, I grew up watching Superman and now everybody's growing up watching like SpongeBob. It, it's two very different realities of what masculinity is aiming to do and what we want our young men to become. Uh, and so, and now, I mean, gosh, now with all the trans stuff and everything else that's going on in the culture, it's only getting more and more confusing, especially for, and, and again, I don't want to say that I'm not concerned about femininity, but I specifically wrote this, uh, and we've, we've already talked about femininity through Mary. So I hold femininity very oh, yeah. high mm -hmm. <laughs> in regard to the feminine warrior. Right. Um, but what I'm talking about right now is masculinity. And, um, one of the things I mentioned in there is what we've done in the world is we've narrowed our understanding of both masculinity and femininity. So while I look at the saints and I've got like, like St. Francis of Assisi over here. I've got Don Juan of Austria, the great crusader over here. I've got St. John de Berbouf over here. They all represent masculinity in Christ, but they perform it or practical or, or, or live it out in a different way. And yet they're all masculine, right? They're all images of masculinity. And what we've done is said, nope, it's only this thing. It's likely toxic. And it's only interested in taking advantage of women overstepping, you know, their bounds and just going after money, cars and girls. And it's like, that's not at all what God intended masculinity to be. Ultimately, masculinity is a reflection of the love of God as father, right? It's more especially shown in a, the life of a father and the life of a husband. So that's a huge call. And sadly, because of the way the culture portrays masculinity in all these different various forms, now we've got this whole, uh, what do they call it, sigma thing where I'm going to eschew all civilization. I'm going to you know, go beyond the rules. It's like, well, <laughs> you have to be part of the civilization to help the civilization. Um, but now it just continues to be this kind of like 
distortion of what it means to be a man. And I think that in the weight room, as we've kind of mentioned already in our earlier in our conversation, when you lift weights, you learn things about what it means to be a man. You know, in the past, it used to be, I'm going to take you out to the farm. You got to farm with all the guys. Um, you know, it's funny. I used to lift weights with my dad pretty, pretty decently regular. Very rarely would we actually talk. We would just do our yeah. thing. And we would <laughs> like, hey, man, you think you can throw on another five pounds? We wouldn't talk about life very much. We would just sit there and like listen to some music and just hit the weights hard, right? And in a way, it was like, yeah, I didn't need to communicate anything. It was my dad teaching me, this is what men ought to do, right? Get calluses, work hard, go out there and, you know, into the world and, and make something of yourself. It wasn't necessarily something that had to be communicated. But now I think we do need to communicate these things. We need to be talking about what it means to be a man. Talk about the fact that that spectrum that the world's offering through the culture is way, way too damn narrow. We need to really understand what masculinity is because I think that's what's causing a lot of this gender confusion, to be honest. It's like just because a girl wants to do something rough and tumble doesn't mean that now she's a male, right? right? Same thing the opposite way. Just because a man wants to be a little bit more soft, it doesn't necessarily mean that he now has to become feminine. Uh, I think in the man, you find the lion and the lamb and you need both. Um, and so we, it, in a way, the weight room can teach us, athletics can teach us what it means to be a man. And um, this is one I'll get my, my fire hose out, man, because I, I just am very passionate about the way, sadly, masculinity is portrayed today. It just, oh gosh, it's, it's ruining a lot of lives. Yeah. The weight room is unique in that uh, it's something that men are designed to excel at. Now, of course, I have three daughters and, you know, they're, they're a female bodybuilder and stuff, but they'll never, ever, ever, ever even if they take all the steroids in the world, they will never be as strong as your, you know, average power lifter, right? And so it's, it's you know, given that we're talking about the weight room, um, this is one of those areas where a boy can become a man because it separates you. And it will, my son is only 12. His sisters are a little bit older than him, but he's already starting to show signs that I'm going to be stronger than you. And I'm catching up very quickly and there's going to come a point and even his height is going to be a point. And the girls are waiting for it. They're like, they pick on, they pick on him now, but they know that there's going to come a point where he's just going to blow right past us and there's nothing we can do. <laughs> exactly. That's happening with my, uh, my oldest is 15. He's a boy and um, he's now, my, my wife's almost six foot and my, and he's now taller than her <laughs> and wider than her. And, you know, his, his muscularity is showing up. And so now it's a whole nother level that it's like, hey, man, if you're disrespectful at all, this just looks bad on you as a man, right. like, because you're now bigger and stronger than her. So don't talk to her like that, you know? Um, so, but it's funny. He, he w was every day measuring next to my wife. And then now it's, uh, he's clearly like two inches taller. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. A uniquely masculine thing. All four girls working out, but it's it's the man cave i'm all for girls especially learning some jujitsu mm -hmm. i think uh you know particularly that position of if a man's trying to take advantage of my daughter i want her to be able to know how to choke that guy out i got no problem with my daughters learning how to do that and it's one of those sports where um it doesn't matter how big you are you can just destroy mm -hmm. somebody with that leverage you know knowing how to use your body i didn't stick with jujitsu <laughs> Maybe because my ego was shot when like a 16 year old girl choked me out. Now, of course, I could have slammed her, but I was playing fair. Sure. And like, you know, we're doing what we have to do. Next thing you know, she's like wrapped around my head and she's choking me. I'm like, seriously? So that's a good point. Uh, you know, <laughs> my daughters play soccer right now, but soon that'll come to an end and they're, they're starting to wonder what should I do next? I think I'm going to take your advice on that. Yeah, we're going to do some jujitsu. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my, my daughters, I've basically just taught them three moves, particularly from a vulnerable perspective. Uh, position. So if you think about a guy trying, trying to take advantage of a girl, well, there's a couple chokes you can do from that position that you choke a guy out, it doesn't matter how big and strong he is, you can just keep choking him until he passes out. And I'm, I'm all for women learning that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, defend yourself if you have to, you know? I, I didn't... Because <laughs> you're not going to win out strength, or like, you know, hitting them right. or trying to push them off. It's not going to happen. But if you go after those cauteroids and you squeeze, like, it's life or death, that guy is going to pass out, if not worse. And to me, some guy's trying to take advantage of my daughter, go right ahead. That's like a soft <laughs> strength. You know, you're talking about the yeah. spectrum of masculinity. And, you know, you got like Muay Thai, which is hard strength. But then there's that soft strength. And so, yeah, even in the weight room, even with athleticism, there's that broad spectrum. We live in this world that wants to just narrow things down. You're a this or you're a that.
Exactly. No. It's, it's a lot more than that. And so is masculinity. Awesome. So that's number five. Number six, thou shalt never use this time for self-glorification as vanity is deadly. Okay. Yeah. So I built this off of that, uh, uh, the other commandment we talked about, about glorifying God ultimately. Um, and basically just a consistent warning that if you're doing this out of personal vanity, out of personal ego, uh, eventually you will find yourself unbalanced. Um, and so whether or not that means that, you know, you have these moments in your life that you uh, were, were vain, 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 and then all of a sudden you realize like this is worth nothing. You know, I mean, I, I had that moment uh, in college where I was all about, you know, just trying to get as, as big and bodybuilding as much as possible. And then I finally had that competition. I'm like, at least for me, this is not my thing. You know, um, I use a, a comparison where like, um, so let's say there's a guy in a weight room and this actually happened when I was in college, but a guy was, um, he had a pretty decent amount on the weight rack that he was doing some bench presses. I think he had like 315 on there or something. And, um, I'm watching this guy from the, the pull down machine and he's just looking at everybody saying who, who's checking me out, you know, who in here is just amazed by the fact that I can knock 315 out. Right. And he starts unracking the weights and unracks them all on the same oh, side. brilliant. Not focused on what he's doing. So what happens is the whole thing falls over. <laughs> he looks like an idiot. You know, everybody's staring at him now, but not because he's cool, because he's like a dummy, you know. So um, it's like that's what ego is, man. When you're so focused on what other people are looking at you doing, eventually it will bite you. Um, and so we just try to, you know, focus in on the fact that vanity, there's a difference between self-love, which I think is a good thing and can, can increase, you know, the way I look, the way I per perform in the, in the weight room or whatever. And then vanity, there's a major difference between, you know, ego and confidence, you know, those kinds of things are just different things. And I, I think, um, the world only offers ego. It only offers vanity. I say focus in on, you know, self-love, which goes way deeper. And two, you start thinking about self-love in regard to how the body is used in the modern context. We use it as a play thing. We use it as a throwaway thing. True self-love, it means I am so dignified, I'm not going to let anyone use me in that capacity. I'm not going to let my own body be used in that capacity. So therefore, I need to focus in on what is good self-love. How do I use this opportunity to not see it as a purely a vain uh, outing or an egotistic outing, but rather something that I'm trying to build who I love about myself and ultimately again in, in, in Jesus. But um, that healthy self-love is something that we are not good at as, as a culture. Yeah. And I agree. It, it totally um, lends itself to a disembodied faith, right? Like uh, you said, the body is a play thing. And the, this culture absolutely gives us this YOLO sense where like, I have this thing, it's beautiful now, let me squeeze the juice. Let me get the most pleasure out of it. Let me use it uh, in, in the most degrading ways, uh, not realizing how divine it is to have this body. And it's a tough one, man, because you know, the world glorifies the flesh. Uh, vanity is, Man, it's, it's more present now than ever before. I saw a really interesting meme the other day uh, that was a play off of the star story of Narcissus, right? Where we get the word narcissist. And, uh, you know, apparently he was staring at himself in the, the glassy mirror of the, um, the lake that they stopped at, right? And so uh, he became mesmerized by his own mirror or the image of himself that everybody left, all the other soldiers left, and he was trapped there. That sort of caused him in a, to move in a spiral downward. Well, this one was, it was somebody looking in the phone and seeing a mirror of themselves. And it's like we literally every day are walking around with Narcissus Pond in our hands, just checking out our, our selfies, checking out what, how other people are responding to ourselves. Um, even myself being, you know, on YouTube, I wasn't prepared because YouTube was brand new at the time. And of course I was very immature. Um, one of the curses of narcissists was that birds followed him around and repeated everything that he said to himself. And so he couldn't even get away from his own words. And I remember just being haunted by my own words. I couldn't even watch my own videos because I was just so, I, my image was so immersed in that pond, in that mirror. And it's a very slippery slope. Uh, you know, people go to the gym today and it's not like, you know, when we went to the gym, when we were in high school, uh, 
nobody was making vlogs about their workouts. Nobody was posting pictures of themselves flexing in the mirror. It, it was just me and my brother and the barbell. Of course, I was looking in the mirror, <coughs> but I wasn't getting feedback from the whole world in an instant about what I'm doing. And so this one's huge. It's a slippery slope. It is. Yeah. And it's, I mean, our culture rewards vanity in a lot of ways. Look at our celebrities mm -hmm. and stuff. I mean, they, you know, a lot of them are just very sadly vain people that make it'll make a lot of money from being very vain. And it just, um, you know, to me, to use again, that image of the warrior in the garden, somebody who doesn't <laughs> care about, you know, what anybody thinks about them, they're working on themselves. They're working on becoming a great warrior. They're working on, on the garden of their soul. Um, that's, that's where it's at, man. I, I remember even back whenever I first got into bodybuilding and watching um, uh, Pumping Iron, I was always much more of a fan of Lou Ferrigno. Like, <laughs> no, that that's my man right there. I don't want to be Mr. Beach going, you know, tan and all that stuff. I'm like, get me down there screaming Arnold. I'm, I'm down for that. <laughs> you mentioned Sigma. Um, but I think there's something to that of like, you're not doing it for out of vanity. You're doing it out of something else. You know? Yeah. There's um there's also this sort of um reaction extreme reaction. You mentioned sigma. I think you mentioned it in this one or one of the um commandments, but that that extreme is also unhealthy too where like you know you, there's this I there's this meme of the of the sigma lifter. You know, he's got his hood on and he's got his ear pods on and it's just him and it's the iron and nothing else matters. He doesn't care about anybody, he doesn't care about anything. He's just tracking his macros, he's doing his work. And he it, it somehow thinks there's virtue in hiding himself from the world, somehow separating himself from the world. But it's no less narcissistic than the person that's shining himself in the world. And I know this, you know, there's this phrase that we like to use in our culture now, you know, in the spheres that I run called monk mode. And so they think that this, you know, the Sigma guy rep represents the monk mode where I'm just focused on me. But when you really consider what the monk would do, it's everything except focus on himself. You know, the Benedictines that moved out. Yeah, they, they were men going their own way, right? They were MGTOW in the, back in the day, but they were doing it in, a, in an ordered way. They weren't doing it to build myself up for me and just focus on me. They were denying society, but also denying themselves. Big difference. Yeah. Yeah, and it's from a, uh, to go back to the idea of masculinity again, that um, ultimately, if you look at the order of how God created hierarchy within the human species, men were created to protect, to provide, you know, preside, um, as our friend, I think Ryan Mickler would usually use those as terms. Um, but the ability to do actions for the good of others over and above myself um, so when it came to like the Benedictines leaving Rome and going out and finding, you know, St. Michel and all of the cave and all of that, it was because they understood the spiritual order of things that we're going out into the woods. We're going out into this cave to fast, to do alms, to pray, because we understand that spiritually we are disordered as a culture and we're going to help provide, protect through properly ordering it again. Uh, and fight the spiritual combat through that way. So when it comes to then the very real kind of MGTOW or, or you know, the Sigma of disappearing, it's like, but what ultimately are you accomplishing for the community? What ultimately are you accomplishing for the culture other than just making yourself big and strong, which again, I think is awesome. But at some point, you got to come out of that cave. At some point, you got to like perform and be a man that provides protects in its own capacity so even if you're not married even if you don't have kids you are called to be a father in this world in some capacity now young men might not quite understand that yet but eventually you'll get there and realize like yeah i need to help coach i need a mentor i need a disciple um and so this idea of migtow if it's if it's to to disappear to come back stronger i'm all for it i think that, that sometimes we need to have our 40 days in the desert and do our thing uh, but if it's to disappear in order to eschew society and in order to eschew community or the culture, that to me just says, like, then you don't understand the proper order of your nature as a man. Like, you you are called to go out and to mentor and to coach. You know, we can complain about the culture all we want, and I think it's pretty messed up. But the best way to go about that is let's start mentoring again. Let's start coaching again. Let's start discipling again. Let's start inviting young men back into the weight room with men that know what it means, you know, to to be a man. Um, and so I just think that, um, sadly, this kind of growth of the stigma and and the, and the hard part is like, in one sense, I get it because it's a hard 
situation out there for young men trying to find a good partner, you know, all of that kind of stuff. It's a, it's a tough reality. But ultimately, we need guys that are willing to work on themselves out in the culture. We need them out create, you know, creating, building, doing. Um, it's just that's the way God ordered it. And so if we are going to help kind of move the culture, save the West, that's it's got to be men leading the charge. Um, and so we need we need the men that are willing to do those things. I love it. This is great. I'm having a lot of fun, man. This is one of my favorites. Hey, man. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, love it's like we're blending bodybuilding and and catholicism exactly. the best things in the world cool so um we are on so that's 10 9 8 7 thou shalt pray before during and after one lifts well i break this commandment Let, tell me more about it and i'll make sure that i do it <laughs> yeah it's, it's a way of just kind of incorporating your spiritual life very seriously and practically into your time in the, in the weight room. You know, oftentimes we don't think about, you know, usually like when I'm getting ready to work out, I might, you know, drink a really strong cup of coffee, maybe a little bit of pre-workout, getting pumped. I'm trying to move my heart a little bit, trying to get the blood moving. But that can still be a time of prayer. Oftentimes we think of prayer as like I need to sit still. I need to make some, take some deep, heavy breaths, calm the mind, maybe pray the rosary calmly. But it's like, you know what? King David was jumping around, going nuts in front of the tabernacle in the Old Testament. What's wrong with praying like that? I, it's like it, this is a way that ancient cultures prayed all the time. Um, and you think about crusaders. You think before going into the war that they were about to fight, they just stood there calmly and didn't let their heartbeat get up. Instead, it's like, let's let's yell some Ave Marias, man. Let's get this going, you know, and let's let's get that, <laughs> that thumos rolling. Uh, in the proper ordo to, or order so that we can go into the weight room properly. Uh, but then in the weight room too, and I, I typically listen to music. I'll have something on um, while I'm in there. I, I've tried doing the, the full silence and sometimes it's good, but I, I like having a little bit of music to listen to. But that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, before you put that, that barbell on your back, before you pick it up over your head, why not just say a little, Lord, this is for you. Lord, this is for you. Mary, this is for you. St. John, this is for you. St. Joseph, this is for you. Use it as you wish. Use it as you wish. You know, and just keep offering it up. Keep offering it up. Uh, and then, lastly, one of my favorite times actually to pray is when I'm done working out and I'm spent, because you have now just given everything. You're sweating, and and if you, depending on what kind of workout you're doing, but I, you know, laying down and you're just kind of letting the sweat roll off. And you're like, Lord, this was awesome, and I hope you can use this in some capacity. I want to give this time to you, um, and now I'm just going to rest. I'm going to rest in you. And so it's like three different kinds of prayer that you get to do during a weightlifting session that people tend to create this kind of like, I don't know if I want to say stereotype, but style of prayer that means I need to be quiet, focused, alone, doing a certain thing. It's like, well, there's other styles of prayer. And I think that nothing that we do that's good for the human person, good for the glorification of God, can't be prayerful. Uh, even if you're working on the car, why not? You can sit there and pray during that time. It's a great time to have a conversation with God. Um, so to me, you know, St. Teresa of Lisieux said that every heartbeat of ours should be a prayer. So why not focus in on weightlifting as an opportunity to do that too? You know, now that I reflect, um, it's interesting. I actually brought training into my prayer life as opposed to the other way around. This is what I mean. And so I pray the rosary every morning. But, you know, I found myself sitting. I was sitting and praying the rosary, and I'm like, I don't want to sit any more than I normally sit. And then I started kneeling, and so I would kneel, and you know, I was kneeling on a pad, and I had my you know feet down, and then I was like, you know what? I need to work on my flexibility. I should be able to kneel, and f totally folded down and sitting on my heels. And so, <laughs> so now, and it's it's painful, and I you know I have to really focus on my Ave Marias. While I and breathing through them, while I'm you know mortifying my body, I'm building flexibility, I'm training my joints, but at the same time I'm in a in a prayerful position, I'm in a humble position, and um and I'm praying my rosary with my body. That's a beautiful thing about the faith too that I, that I've discovered is that it's it's a it's such a physical uh, faith that a lot of the prayers are like you know, with the beads or with the, with the kneeling or genuflecting, like it's a very physical, all the prayers are very physical. I mean, we don't just jump into prayers like Protestants do, which is very cool when they do it. It just flows. But there's, you know, the opening, crossing your body. The body is brought into prayer. 
Yes. Yeah, one of my my favorite um, stories of Christ is the healing of the blind man when he spits in the mud and then takes that mud and rubs it in the guy's eyes. And like we worship a Lord that got mud out of the earth and rubbed it right in a guy's eyes in order to heal him, in order to open his eyes. So that embodiedness is what we are called to participate in. Like we we need physical things. I love when incense is at mm. mass. I love when there's loud bells. I love even the idea of going to Eucharistic adoration and sitting there looking at our Lord in the the species of bread. It's like this is a very physical thing that I can literally look right at. Um, and then the of course the history of the icon the icons and and you know the the uh, statuaries and all of that stuff that's part of our faith. I just think that that God infused so much of what it means to worship, what it means to participate into the created order that, man, when it comes to weightlifting, when it comes to disciplining the body in that way, I, I just, it's an amazing opportunity to say, even this blood, sweat, and tears is yours, Lord. Like, this is, this is you know, as about as gritty as I'm going to get with my prayer, and I'm going to give it to you, you know. Take that mud and put it in my <laughs> eyes during this time, right? Yeah. <laughs> that spit and mud and put it in my eyes. Yep. <laughs> I like how you mentioned, you know, the, the idea that we have to have a set time for prayer, you know. Um, when I returned to the faith, I... I kind of came in through some Orthodox books because I started fasting and then I discovered the Philokalia and I started, you know, reading the, the, the Desert Fathers and, you know, the early church, which, of course, you know, kind of reminded me that, oh, I'm actually Catholic. But one of the things uh, that I started practicing and it was so helpful for me at the time because I was I was struggling in life. I, you know, I made some mistakes and you know, that's why I was brought back to the faith, but was to pray the Jesus prayer unceasingly. And uh, I remember reading a book by St. Ignatius of Brianna Shav um, on the Jesus prayer and how he's, he called it the prayer of the heart. And so it's like you, you, you breathe the prayer. And so on the inhale, and I still find if I can't sleep at night, I'll still do it. Uh, or if I'm stressed out, I'll do it. And it's just, it's, it's physical because you're, it's a, it's a embodied prayer, but on the inhale, it's Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And so you need to think about Bruce Lee, right? And yeah, totally. here we are. We're we're breathing <laughs> totally. in the light of Christ. And yes, yes, yeah. What I love about the the Catholic Church too, um, if for any of your listeners, if they get the opportunity, just go online and look up uh, Catholic Church Catechism, and look up prayer. There's a whole section on prayer, and in it they define the various levels of prayer. So you mentioned the idea of the way Protestants pray, which they call ejaculatory pray, prayer, uh, which was used in particular. But um, it, it's the idea of of randomness, of of, of coming to God, of, of Lord, you know, looking at God and doing as much as we can to praise Him, to worship Him, you know, all of that. But then there's what we might call rotary prayer or the traditional prayers, such as the Hail Mary, the Our Father, these prayers that are given to us. And the beauty is that within each one, I think there's five, four or five levels of, of styles or types of prayer. And the beauty is that in the Catholic Church, you find the depth of every single one of them. And you can participate in every single one of them. So going to a high liturgy, which is the highest form of prayer, the highest form of worship that we can have on this earth, there's all this orderliness to it. And there's these very specific prayers that are supposed to be said. But then there's moments of the opportunity for the, for the faithful to come to the Lord and say, these are the prayers of the faithful. Lord, we're praying for this. Lord, this person died. Please you know, bring their soul to heaven with you. You know, all these kinds of things. And to me, it's like that shows such an incredible depth of what God's offered us to participate in his love that there's nothing really, I mean, granted, there are some things out of bounds in how we do certain things, but in a way, God has placed these in our hearts. And so whenever it's natural, whenever it comes forth. So even if like your, your listeners can't think of something to say, you know, before um, lifting weights, but they want to pray something, hey, we got rotary prayers. Say a rotary prayer. That's fine. You know, say you say those things that the Lord has or that, that the church has taught is the right way to say things to our Lord and the right way to worship our Lord. Um, but then at the same time, you can have those moments of like, Lord, I'm lost. I don't know what to do. I'm just here to ask you, please help me. Or Lord, this person's hurt and I need to help them. You know, we can do all of it. And that's the beauty of being a Catholic. I think that um, as much as I love our Protestant brothers and sisters, their inability to do the sign of the cross, their inability to say the Hail Mary just breaks my heart. 
because there's so much grace in those things. And there's so much that is good for the human person, ultimately, through grace, but also through our own humanity, um, that it's good to be ordered in that fashion. And so I just, I love the fact that we have all these various ways. I've done years of Liturgy of the Hours where it's very orderly, there's very specifics. I've done years of having like, hey, you know, I really just am not into that right now. So I'm going to go do my rosary. And that's going to be the main thing I'm focused on. You're still focused on the gospel. You're still focused on, you know, this idea of consistently going back to our Lord. Um, and so it gives you all these options. And I, I just think that that's, that's a really awesome spirituality or a really awesome spiritual gift that the church brings us to say, look, if you're just not feeling this thing, maybe you're just not there, you know, and that's fine. Go this route. There's all these other routes you can take. Um, so anyway, that, that's just kind of me preaching, uh, to the, to the non-Catholics out there, but I, I just personally love it. Yeah. I love that too. It's, it's freeing, you know, to the ejaculatory prayers are cool, but at a certain point, like you run out of things to say, you start sounding the same mm -hmm. anyway, mm -hmm. why not use the prayers that the saints taught us thousands of years ago, right? Like you just made up your own. <laughs> exactly. at, at, at first it was cool, but now you're, you're saying the same thing. And so it gives me a sense of freedom, and I like I love memorizing them, right? Because at any moment, it's yes. if it's a moment of prayer, it does, and I think sometimes it becomes an ego thing too. Like, oh, I hope I say the right thing, or I I hope I don't sound silly, or I hope that was a good prayer. I was like, if I pray the Saint Michael prayer, it always sounds good. It never sounds bad. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and you're participating in something that's hundreds of years old. Right, we're talking about saints, you know, centuries ago, saying the exact same things. Why, why would I not want to do something as awesome as that? That just seems like, <laughs> you know, I think one of my favorite saints is also he's not a saint yet. I think he's blessed or a servant of God is Don Juan of Austria. He's one of the few crusaders who became ultimately, you know, on the path towards sainthood. And um, I mean, I'm thinking that guy played probably likely played the rosary. Why would I not want to do that? Why would I not want to participate right. in something that this guy who, I mean, <laughs> fought for the West, fought for Catholicism, fought for his faith in this most heroic fashion, I just want to emulate whatever that guy did. I want to imitate whatever that guy did because that I, ultimately who I want to be, you know? So if it sounds rotary, if it sounds kind of boring, the church offers all these yeah. opportunities to do other things, but there's something... I would even say warrior-like about doing the regular. You mentioned the Bruce Lee thing of even breathing in, breathing out, saying the same words, because it's creating a rhythm in you and it's creating the opportunity to focus on what you're doing. Um, so I just, I don't know. There's such a treasure trove there that it's it's incredible to me. I think it's one of the great pathways into the Catholic Church is participating in some of these spiritual acts that we can do. Yeah, the prayers. Um, and we're sticking with this one for a little while because it's so awesome. <laughs> um, I recently learned to pray the rosary in Latin. So what's really cool is like once you learn the prayers, well, now you can learn it in the language that, <laughs> that they used exactly. it when they made it up. Exactly. Yeah. And what, what better way to, to, you know, one of the issues that we have in modernity is this like loss of meaning, this loss of a complete cosmos. And when you learn something like Latin, you are now through language itself tied to thousands of years of history. I like you're you're participating in something that's so much bigger than you, and all you're doing is being able to say these words in a rotary fashion. But you're participating in something much bigger than yourself when you do that. Um, that's why they called it the universal language of the church, because no matter what culture we went to, no matter what their language was, we can use this to to teach them how to worship. Um, and so that's why it's still a tradition in the church. But uh, I just think that, yeah, I mean, we can go into the whole modernism thing too and the, the issue with the cosmos. But to me, prayer is just the great way of tapping right into the, to the traditions, to these ancient cultures. Um, you know, I remember one time I did a video probably nine, 10 years ago about um, how to increase your masculinity, how to be more of a man. And one of the principles was pray. And I remember somebody commenting underneath or shared it and said something like, this is the most ridiculous thing. What kind of a man spends his life on his knees? And I'm like, hey, guess what? The American Indians prayed. The Vikings prayed. The Japanese samurais prayed. Like all these incredible warrior cultures of our time, of the entire millennia of, of humanity, have all prayed. Not all of them have been necessarily Catholic, but they've all prayed. There's something there that we participate in when we do those things and it calls us to a higher good ultimately right i love that scene in gladiator whenever he has the statue of his wife and daughter 
And he's talking to them as if they're in the afterlife. And he's like, I know I'll see you again. And, the, and his friend asks, you know, what do you say to them? And he's like, to my son, hold on to the horse like this. And, but he's like, to my wife, it's not for you to know. You know, it's like, but you're participating in prayer in this kind of beyond physicality, beyond materialism, that our, our world just doesn't do well now. And so I think this is an opportunity where in one way you're participating in physical culture. You're literally physically holding on to things, barbells, rough, cold things. And at the same time, you're inviting Christ in with prayer. You're, you're praying it's like you are now participating in those same things that the American Indians understood, that the Japanese samurai, samurai understood, that American Indians understood, that th this is only good insofar as it's accomplishing something beyond ourselves. And so why not do that in this time? I love it. That's awesome. Cool. So that was number seven. Let's see. Eight, nine, ten. All right. Number eight. Commandment number eight. Thou shalt pray that one's strength is useful in the will of God. I like that. Yeah, and this goes back to something we, we said a little bit earlier, that we're all given a mission uh, by God, and we're all given various vocations. You know, some might be called to the priesthood, some might be called to married life. Most people will be called to married life. Um, but we are all given missions uh, to be, and I was thinking particularly of men as fatherhood, brotherhood, you know, those kinds of things that um, if you're going to get big and strong, it can't just be to be big and strong. As cool as that is, there needs to be other aspects of it. It doesn't mean you can't be less big and strong. Get as big and strong as you necessarily want to be and can be, but just know that it's only good insofar as it's teaching you to be something in your mission. Uh, so if you're lifting and you have, you have children or if you're lifting and you have a wife, that's what's ultimately being worked on. You know, you can aim at your goals, have your PRs, you know, you want to deadlift 1,000 pounds, go do it, man. But just realize that there's a larger part of this, that, that what you're doing ultimately is training towards being a better father, better husband, better boyfriend, better man, ultimately. Um, and I think ultimately for us as Catholics, we, we fulfill our sanctity insofar as we live out the will of God. And the will of God is our sanctity. It is for us to be saints, right? He desires us to live, be with him in the afterlife for all eternity. And so in this way, you're, you can work on your sanctity. You can work on your character. You can work on better understanding your mission, your vocation. Um, why would you not take these moments when you're lifting heavy things to do that? You know, that just makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, and I've experienced that if I'm not keeping the will of God in mind, he'll remind me. Uh, I think that's where a lot of my injuries come from, right? The minute I begin to slip into egotism or vain, it's like, wait a second, you're not, I gave you this gift, and you're not using it for what I want you to use it for, and so I need to course correct you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, ego lifting is a thing, mm -hmm. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and people get hurt, you know, out of those kinds of things. One of the guys that I, I actually have followed his um, plan quite a bit is Jim Windler. He does the 531. Uh, and a big principle for him, you know, is, um, uh, what does he call it? Minimal, uh, minimal increases for maximal effort, right? So he, he says, you know, rather than trying to throw 50 pounds on and get one squat out of it, throw five pounds on and build up, you know, as you, as you go, because when, sometimes what we want to do is like, Hey, I'd really like to hit that 500 pound squat. I've only done 425. So now I'm going to throw 75 pounds on and see what I can do. It's a great way to get hurt. Um, but the idea of chipping away at those things that are unessential to the will of God, even in the weight room, uh, it's like, well, then ultimately you're not going to find yourself injured. You're not going to find yourself trying to ego lift. E granted, ego lifting is a lot of fun sometimes, but uh, it can lead towards injury, especially as you get older <laughs> type of thing. So, um, but I love that idea. And Mike Minster was like that too, of this idea of do the minimal things properly and you will get maximal effort in the end. Um, and I think that, you know, we do these things in our life all the time of, you know, we try to pick up the, the things that, great big grand goals granted i'm all about goals um but if it's not in line with what we're meant to be ultimately which is saints um then you're going to find yourself off track at some point and i think that the physical culture can tell you that but also mental the mental side of things and uh our, our even our just physical goals our, our, our financial goals uh if those are out of line with what god wants ultimately for us uh ultimately that means they're meaningless to be just completely frank Right. Um, because if it's not making you a saint, right. then what, what is it? What is it accomplishing? Yeah. Right. Um, if it's just fulfilling your ego, then that's nothing or worse. So it's... I think that the weight room is a great way to learn that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If it's not in God's will, then 
there's no gray area, then it's Satan's will. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so uh, number we're up to number nine. Thou shalt listen for the whispers of God in this time of reflection. Okay, so we're lifting weights and God is whispering. Yeah, you know, it's... Um... So I'm not very good yet, even now, about being able to tell you exactly what line it is in Scripture. All I know is that Scripture says it, <laughs> that God does not come in a gong. He does not come in, you know, these loud, uh, you know, moments. Rather, it's these small whispers. It's these small moments that he comes. And there's a mystery to that. Uh, and I think that sometimes what we, we think, and this spills into the weight room, but also spills out into our real life, that we want this kind of road to, to Damascus moment, like St. Paul where God just like slams me upside the head. And granted, he's done that to me without a road Damascus moment of like, you idiot, what were you thinking? You know, those kinds of things. Um, but in the weight room, I think it's the ability to like really sit and reflect. And of course, I come from more of a powerlifting background where sometimes you're waiting three to five minutes in between, you know, sets. And you're trying to kind of calm the self a little bit up until about 60 seconds before, get back jacked up a little bit. I think, man, that's a great little three minutes there of just being able to like calm the mind, just calm the mind. Um, Bruce Lee said one of the greatest things to master is learning how to remain calm. And in that calmness, in that stillness, that's when you hear the whispers of God. That's when you hear the ability to do that. But that also means the idea of negative self-talk, which personally I've struggled with that my whole life, uh, but I think a lot of guys do. Um, but the idea of also caring what other people think, ultimately, <laughs> we get those voices in our head, kind of what you mentioned about narcissists with the birds you know, chirping. The ability to focus the mind and say, no, I'm trying to hear the words of my Savior himself right now. That is such a great mental exercise for everybody. Uh, but I think especially in the weight room, there's these moments where it's like, it's intense, but then I can also calm. Intense, and I can calm. Intense, and then calm. I think that's a great way to get your body kind of used to, and your mind especially used to, uh, being able to calm the self. Uh, because sometimes what happens is, um, just in relationships and, and work sometimes, you know, we have these moments where something makes us angry and we're just, bam, you know, anger can get off. I think that when you realize, like, there are moments in the weight room, especially where you can, there's moments to be up here and there's moments to calm. Moments to be up here, moments to calm. Um, I just think that's a really, really good mental exercise. Yeah, and knowing the distinction between the two and when it's proper, like, you know, I've discovered as I've gotten older that this when I have this sense that uh, in the past I would need some kind of um, caffeine, right? Like I'm not feeling, yeah. feeling like yeah. pumped up and I'm thinking, well, that means I need, I need some energy. I need some caffeine. I need a, a, a pre-workout when in reality I'm tired, but wired. And what I really need yeah. is to go yes. with what the whispers, which is God is saying, no, you don't need more revving up. I'm trying to tell you, it's time to relax and calm down. And in fact, if I do bring my energy down, then the work that I'm doing flows that much more seamlessly. As opposed to in the past, I drink some coffee mm -hmm. and it's like, I got, now I'm even more wired and nothing gets done. And if it does get done, it's crazy. It's knowing the distinction. Just because yes. you're uncomfortable doesn't mean that you need to be revved up. It might actually mean you need something to bring you down. Exactly. Yeah, I think too that, um, especially guys who are used to weight room being intense, you know, those kinds of things, learning that it's okay to rest. It's okay to not always be revved up all the time. More recently, I've tried to do the whole like Navy SEAL thing where you take a little 20 minute nap. Uh, it's very difficult for me because it takes me a long time to fall asleep, but to force yourself to lay down, you know, usually they would say, put your feet up at least by about a foot and just try to close your eyes and completely shut the mind off from voices, from all these other things, that little 20 minutes can make you last that many more hours in performance as like a Navy SEAL or a weightlifter or whatever. So I've been trying to do that a lot more. And you realize like, man, we are such a sleep deprived people uh, these days. It's very difficult to, and I, I think, you know, eight hours is probably, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, a little bit too much. I think most of us can survive on six or seven. Uh, but I mean, there's Navy SEALs. I, I'm a huge Jocko Willing fan. I think that guy's, you know, got some great stuff out there and he sleeps like four hours a night. <laughs> like, man, if I said four hours a night, I'd be asleep by like two o'clock in the afternoon. I just, I, I can't do it. So I'm trying to train myself to say, no, 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 you know, now's the time. <clears throat> it's okay to rest. It's okay to just turn it off. Um, so learning how to do that physically is a great way. So learning how to like fall asleep fast, learning how to do these things. I, I just think that it's good for us. I think that, um, you know, it used to be, let's go farm, 
We're going to eat lunch. We're going to take a little minute, a little nap, and then we're going to go farm until sundown. But we don't really do that anymore. So how do we figure that out? You know, because we work, a lot of us work eight to fives. And uh, so we got to figure out those little moments where like, I'm going to disappear for 20 minutes and just try to close my eyes and literally go to yeah. sleep <laughs> and try to be up, mm -hmm. you know, and then not rely on caffeine so much. My dad grew oh, up I in Belize. Coffee. And so they use hammocks. And so he brought mm -hmm. that into that brought that into his uh, lifestyle here and he never doesn't have a hammock and i discovered that that's the key to my he's you know he's over 70 years old now and he's just he he was at my house climbing trees the other day and, and cutting it down with a chainsaw i mean the guy but his 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 secret is you got to hop in that hammock a couple times a day as he gets in the hammock there's something about a hammock yeah. like and the way he describes it is funny he says it's, it's like a womb because if you you got to get the the type that kind of yeah, covers yeah. it, go, wraps around you, and you get your feet up and you just swing there, and it's like you're swinging in your mom's womb. And he says you just got to go go get reborn in that hammock. So try try the that's hammock. Awesome. <laughs> I will. I will. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, commandment number ten: Thou shalt rack the weights when finished. The one true God is a God of order. I like that. I can relate to that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, part of it came from my annoyance that I would go to gyms a lot of times and a lot of these young guys just leaving the weights out. And, and you know, my, my growing up, so my, again, my, my dad had a weight room and he would even tell me like, you know, we had certain weights where the numbers were on this side and he preferred that the numbers always be on the inside. So like when you when you put the weights on, the numbers are always on the inside, partially because there's that lip there for you to grab the the weight to pull it off. So it's a whole lot easier when you pull it off to rack it. Um, so if I ever did it where the numbers were on the outside, he'd be like, Jared, don't lift. Go over here and fix this, right? And so it was one of those things of even in the weight room, these little moments of orderliness, right? People say godliness is close to orderliness mm -hmm, or orderliness mm -hmm. is close to godliness. I think that's absolutely true, actually. You know, the whole idea today of like make your bed. Yeah, because when you get up first thing in the morning and you have to accomplish something that orders your room, you are now on the path of being ordered during the day, right? And so it's similar to what we mentioned earlier of like having a certain schedule during the day of like, I have this order by which I'm going to live my life because I need to accomplish certain things. And the weight room in particular, if you're just throwing the weights around, number one, you might just get hurt because you're going to leave weights somewhere and it'll fall on your foot or, you know, whatever it might be. But number two, like have some dang respect for the weights themselves. Like realize that um, number one, you can get hurt. But number two, like these are like, <laughs> I don't want to say, you know, priceless things, but in a sense, these things can last your entire life if you treat them properly. I still have the same weights I bought when I first got married 16 years ago, and they still serve me well. My 45 pounds is still my 45 pounds. It's my, my buddy, you know, so I'm going to treat it nice. And it's the same thing in our life. Like if, if my car is junked out, I, it, it makes my, I, I, I can't stand it. I have to clean it. I have to vacuum it. I have to get it clean. Um, and so it's, in a way, God is a God of order, not of chaos. Um, and so if we are going to participate in God's goodness, in his attributes, such as order, then we need to do the little things properly. We need to order, you know, even the way we, we dress, the way we stand, they should be all, you know, ordered in a certain sense. Um, and I think that in the weight room, especially, uh, because of the potential of getting hurt, if you do anything disorderly or chaotic, then why wouldn't you live ordered? Why wouldn't you want to live ordered in the, in the gym? So, um, I see some of these like bodybuilders and stuff that do some of this crazy stuff in the gym where they're, you know, trying to curl, you know, 400 pounds and stuff. And I'm like, look, I get it, man. But, uh, I can tell you that's pretty chaotic <laughs> in, in my book, um, uh, because <laughs> they're likely going to get hurt somewhere. Um, but I don't know. It's just a great way to kind of, kind of physically say, I'm not going to live a chaotic life. And it starts here. I remember know? reading this book, um, the Sacred and Profane by Mercer Eliade, and he talks mm. about how you make things sacred by creating ritual around it. So, you know, the fact that you turn the plates inside out, it's like that's a ritual. And as a result, you you take something that's profane, okay, we're lifting weights, we're just slapping on plates, to no, it's a sacred act because there's a ritual, there's a way that we do it, and then it elevates the, <laughs> the entire thing. Exactly. It's funny, even if I'm lifting with a friend and they do it backwards, I can't do the lift. 
You profane the barbell. <laughs> it's sacrilege. <laughs> the ritual's off, man. Exactly. So I just think that, um, and that includes things, you know, even like machines and stuff of like, one of the worst things you can do to the other people in the gym, granted, I work out in my garage, so I don't, you know, my wife lifts weights, and so I don't want to leave a mess for her. Uh, but one of the worst things you can do for somebody who goes to a gym is like, hey, there's a big sweat, you know, mass up at the top where your head was touching the the, the uh, um, bench. There's also, you know, you left some weights on there. I can't even lift that or, or it's too light or whatever. Like the last thing you want is somebody else to come up and have to wipe your sweat off, have to take your weights off. It's just, it, number one, it's just rude. But I think that as a man, you should not say, like, I don't care about you enough that I'm going to leave this completely disordered. I'm just going to leave because I got what I wanted, wanted out of it. And that's a horrible way to live um, in the weight room, but also out, too. Like, I'm just going to use these things to my advantage. I'm going to use and abuse them as much as I want. I don't care who gets this after me. You know, you should think about your car in the sense of, you know, eventually you might have to sell that thing. And the person after you is going to want it ordered. They're not going to want it torn up. They're not going to want it smelling like dog crap. They're not going to want it, you know, all that kind of stuff. I feel like that 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 used to be, at least it feels this way, used to be the norm. You take care of your things, you know. My, my grandparents had the same washing machine for like 50 years because they just took care of the same thing. And now I'm like, granted, I think they build things to break these days. But it's like I, I want my things to last, I want my house to last. I don't want it to turn to junk the minute I'm done with it. So to me, it's just, one, there's a divine aspect to it, that you're participating in an attribute of God by being ordered. You know, there's an order to the cosmos. There's an order to the way things are created. And, and in that way, you're participating in it. But number two, just for you, for your habits, for your life, it's good for you to be ordered and, and consistently, cons because part of it is self-respect, to be completely honest. Like, if you're disordered, if you're living a chaotic, chaotic life, it's because you've, you've lost respect in yourself. Um, and so that spills over into other areas of life. But uh, again, going back to the weight room, I think that's just a great physical way to teach people to live an ordered life. I agree. The Ten Commandments of Lifting Weights. That was so proper. Every bit of it was perfect. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you so much, Jared. This has been an amazing talk, man. Yeah, man. So what do you got going on? Where can, uh, happy to you know, so. I know you were making some podcasts back in the day and you, you create a lot of media. Um, where can people learn more about what you got going on these days? Yeah, so if they wanted to check out my my social handles, um, almost all of them are just Jared Zimmer. Uh, they can go there for sure. Um, after this conversation, uh, so as of right now, actually, the book is um, out of print, um, but I'm actually thinking about just putting it up for, as a free PDF. If people just want to give me their email address, they can get it, and I'll just give them the whole book. Um, all good. So I'm, I'm going to set that up, um, and I will start sharing that on my social media whenever that's ready. Um, the other aspect is that I am now here at Benedictine College uh, in Atchison, Kansas, and uh, we've got some great content coming out later this year, uh, probably starting in, in the, later this summer. Uh, we'll be releasing some things. I'm actually in the studio now for some of the stuff we're going to be filming. So um, some big stuff coming there as well. Uh, but yeah, those would be kind of the main two spots. Nice. For me. Yeah, I did go look up your book on Amazon again because like I said, I left my copy at home and I was like, maybe there's a Kindle edition. I saw one copy, a used copy for $77. I was like, wow, <laughs> somebody's trying to hawk that book, but hey, it's worth it. But now you got them, the Ten Commandments of Lifting. Yeah. Thank you, brother. God bless you. And uh, I hope to do this again sometime. Absolutely, man. Anytime. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive or entrepreneur who's dominating in business, but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com, fill out an application, and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done.